We all remember recess growing up in school. Recess was a time of day where you could have all the conversations that you could not have while in class. Recess, recess is where you had the real conversations and real conversations we're going to have. In each episode of the Recess Podcast, I'm going to have real conversations explaining students and school. I'm David McGuire, and I'll be your host. It's recess time, y'all. Students and school. Good I'm evening, beautiful people. David it's McGuire really here, real. excited about this episode. Yes. Uh, I have my beautiful people. David it's McGuire real. here, excited about, and arguably one of the, what I think is the most prolific voices um, and writers when it comes to educational topics here in Indianapolis. Uh, tonight's show, we, we're titling it NDK 12 Takeover. So this is the first time that I've had the opportunity to get one of my fellow NDK 12 people to jump on for us to have a discussion, a debate, a dialogue, a strategizing meeting about education in Indianapolis. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Educator Barn, Shante Barn. What are we calling you this evening? What, what name we call you? <laughs> We're going to call you Shante. So, Shante Barnes, better known as Educator Barnes, if you follow any of her work, um, she's going to be with me tonight, and we are going to have uh, a great conversation. It's entitled unapologetically black and so we're gonna we're gonna just be unapologetically black about the things we talk about um if you notice at the bottom there i have a link to our blog if you've never read our blog check us out indie.education follow us on social media at indie uh kids winning so we're excited about this topic uh so we're gonna jump right in so shall i say i i really read uh one of your blogs i think for the fourth time <laughs> and it was actually one of the driving factors that made me want to have this discussion. So if you haven't read it, again, visit the website, Indie Diet Education. The piece is titled, If You Want to Keep Educators Like Me, You Need to Think Beyond Your Diversity Quota. And so I want to read a section from the piece It said that stood out to me. The system pushes you down. The players who keep the system going mistreat you, and you feel shame and anger. So for the folks listening, Shantae, like, explain the systems and the players that you were referring to in that piece. <laughs> Well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, when I'm thinking about the system, I'm just thinking about the education system. And if you think about our current system, it wasn't built. It wasn't built for black educators. It wasn't built for black children. And so we are in the system that's not built for us, but we're trying to help children, all children. Um, but I'm unapologetic about the fact that my focus is black children. I say that all the time and that makes people upset. But I'm raising two black sons. And when I go into a classroom, I want all the kids to succeed, but I have a problem when the black kids don't succeed. So that's like the system that I'm talking about. And then the players can be superintendents, um, leaders of uh, charter networks, principals, mm -hmm. system principals, administrators, teachers, instructional coaches, um, paraprofessionals that are in the classroom. There's all these different people that have um, influences, whether it's positive or negative, and you're in this and you're trying, because if anybody believes that education is not political and when people are like, just let me teach, like, those people really annoy me because yeah. you can be in education and not take a viewpoint and just be like, I'm just gonna close my door and teach because people that do that are just ignoring all the problems and they're not solving any problems also. Yeah. So when you when you you mentioned a couple, you said superintendents, I heard you say principals, and we're going we're going to probably talk a little bit more about principals. So if I'm gonna say, was this the first? Because I think you did two pieces. Was this the first installment or the second installment of this series that you did? Which one was this one? This was the first one. Okay. Was interesting because this one got posted in a lot of different groups for Black educators online. Mm -hmm. And I started reading through the comments and sometimes I respond to people and sometimes I, I don't because it's something I just want to read. But the number one thing that kept popping up was that it's black females, black Ooh, yeah. female principals that are holding back black female educators. And I had all these black females saying, oh, I had the best time working for a white male, but that black females, I can't work for no black females. I just heard all this negativity, which made me write the second piece. Mm -hmm. And I got pushed back. I actually got more pushback on the second piece than the first one because people, I used the word diverse and I didn't use the word black. And that was actually intentional because okay. I, it was diverse. Because when I think about like my current principal is biracial, she's black and white. Mm -hmm. My last two principals were black females. Before that, I had a white male principal. Before that, my principal from India had a white female principal. 
I had a principal from Turkey and then I had a white female principal. So mm -hmm. I had four diverse principals. So I really wanted to talk about like navigating that space, not just with a black administrator, but black, but with administrators that are not even from America. Cause right. that's like another level that we don't even talk about. We talk about like the same race issues, black women pushing down black women, but we don't talk about that cross cultural clash that happens sometimes. Yeah where you have issues between black and Latinx, or you have issues with black people and people from other countries who may have a perception about you based on what they learned in their country about black folks. And so for me being a black educator, there's mm -hmm. all these areas you're trying to navigate. And I'm just like, I'm just trying to help the kids. Like I don't got time for this. <laughs> so, and, and so to, I want to stay on that topic because I know that was one of our things we want to talk about. So this idea of the mistreatment of black women in education, right? So. I'm, first, I want to shout out Melanated Ed, who's doing a book study, I think, in a couple of weeks over a book called The Motto. Um, and it's, it's, it's from the perspective of a, of a black um, professional woman who talks about racism in the workplace and, and all these different that black women have to go to. So when you think as a black woman in education who's been doing this for a while, why, why does it seem like black women fall at the bottom of the totem pole? when it comes to education and to your piece, right? I think what you were getting at was, you also get this same heat from other black women. So like, what what, what have you seen? What have you heard? Because we're also gonna talk about the stories that we've heard from black educators, right? This plight of black education. So not just think about your own story, but think about the stories you heard from other black women. Why is there such this mistreatment for black women in education, specifically in Indianapolis? Because that's all we can talk about is our locale right now. So. Right. What's and going I think on with that? Because when you think about education, there's a big push, you know, black male educators are just 2%. And you even talk about <laughs> the fact that a black male could be in the classroom for a hot second and they an admin yeah. or they white, like, you know, culture or something. Uh -huh. black if you are a black female up against a black male, a lot of times you lose out, not because you don't have the qualifications, but if I want to push out something, I want to be like, hey, I, I don't have a, a diversity gap with black male. I got a black male here because the number mm -hmm. of the kids are typically getting kicked out of the classroom. I mean, it's black students, but a lot of times it is black boys. Yeah. And so you have, oh, let me get this black male. He's going to have a relationship with these kids. He's going to get these kids in line. And so you're a black female. is. It's like you're fighting other people. And the other thing I tell people, because now I'm in the position where I've been sitting, I've been sitting in on interviews since I became a literacy coach. For the last four years, I've been sitting on interviews. And now I'm like leading like my hiring team, which is interesting. That's a whole interesting process. <laughs> but when you're in this process and you're thinking about other people, you have people who are just in some type of competition with you for no reason. And I know uh, my parents, my dad said something to me that he's never said. One of the jobs I was at uh, where I had a black female principal, my dad told me, you need to quit that job because I know who you are. And he said, Whoa. there's only so much of that you're going to put up with. And I was like, and my dad's never Heavy. told me to quit anything <laughs> in my life. Like anytime I go, I go to my, my dad's the person I go to because he's always going to tell me to stay in the fight. Mm -hmm. And this time it was the first time ever my dad said, walk away. He said, you, he said, you're in a pissing competition with this person and he said, you don't got time for that. And he's, and, that, and that's how I kind of felt like I was in a competition. So when you bring diverse people to the table, what people don't understand is that person is going to shake your status quo. What people want is I want to bring a black person to my school, but I didn't want to say I got a black person, but I don't want them to actually bring anything and change anything. And what we don't understand is with black people. I, two black women can have two different ideas. And so black women sometimes want you to ride for them and their ideas and not counter anything. And the no. moment you counter something, they get mad and they try to come for you. And I'm, and I'm just like, I don't have time for this. And like I told one principal, I said, what you're doing is not working for me. I don't have to be here. Yeah. And I'm very clear because sometimes principals make it seem like if they're going to hold stuff over your head. Like, I'm not going to write you a reference letter. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to. I had one principal told me if I left and gave me a good uh, uh, evaluation. Mm -hmm. If you leave uh, next school year, I'll be, I will not answer the phone. I was like, OK, don't answer the phone. And when I sat in the interview uh, and I said, this is my principal's number. She said she's not going to answer the phone. And here's the reason why I said it in the interview. Uh -huh. And um, that particular um, school did offer me a job. I didn't accept the job because I had another offer I went with. But I'm very honest. I don't let anybody carry threats over my head or make mm -hmm. me feel like they're going to hold me captive out of school. Yeah. I go to the interview. I'm like, this is what it is. 
This is, and what was interesting about this particular principle, when I went to go say that, they said we weren't even going to check that principle for your reference anyway, because we know how that person is. Oh, so man. Reputation preceded me to the interview. And so that's the thing that bothers me sometimes is that we just have a lot of this negativity out here. And mm. I personally don't want to be a part of it. I'm not interested in trying to compete with you. And I yeah. told one person, I told a colleague that who kept thinking I was competing with her. I said, the only guy I compete with is Shantae Barnes. I, can't <laughs> argue with you. I said, you're not even a factor. And then I told uh -huh. this person, I said, and if you were a factor and I was competing with you, I'm going to tell you I'm competing with you and I tend to win. Like I'm mm. not here like playing games with folks. And a lot of people in education, they want to play games. They want to be in your face one minute and they stab you in the back the next minute. And then don't even get me started about nepotism and friendships and yeah. all that stuff, block and stuff. Listen, so and, and I don't again, if you're just tuning in, this is the Recess Podcast. I'm David McGuire. This is Unapologetically Black. I have my my counterpart, my friend, uh, my fellow educator and educated writer, Shante Barnes, or better known as Educator Barnes. And we're talking about what it means to be unapologetically black. And so we're on this topic of black women. And if you look on the bottom of the screen, if you're tuning in with us live, check out our blog at Indy.Education. We're talking about her, her latest, one of her latest pieces. If you want to keep educators like me, you need to think beyond your diversity quota. So there's a piece in there. Um, and again, I'm not going to spoil it because I really want people to read it. But when I tell you there's a section in there where you tell the story about the back and forth with your principal about, I think it was a threat you had with another colleague. Woo, child, listen, I, I, I got to commend you because I think that day I'd have lost my Christianity. Like, I just, I just would have. I just, and I, I, I commend you. But my question is, why, why are black women, and I, I think honestly, that piece is not even just for black women educators. I think any black woman in any professional setting can relate to that. So when you think about, that because now you're in that leadership position, right? How do you make sure that your experiences as a teacher from black females doesn't dictate how you lead other black females? Yes. So with my this is my first year in admin. I'm an academic dean supervising fifth through eighth grade middle school, um, English, social studies, and then the art teacher. Next year, I will be doing all elective in English and some other stuff. Um, but this school year, everyone on my team um, was white. And then I had one lady who was lat uh, Latina. Mm -hmm. And so even going into that, I thought about how what can I do not to be like the people that I have problems with. And so that's kind of the mind thing. And uh, recently, I think the last piece I wrote for NDK 12, I actually published the um, the survey, the direct supervisor survey that my staff, like it was unfiltered, unedited. I put it up there and I even, cause I shared it with my team and then I shared it and I wrote a reflection because one of the things I said in that piece, if I'm going to talk about people all the time, like I'm like, it is what it is. I said, if I'm going to talk about administrators. I'm going to put myself out here. And this is how I did my first year. Here are the things I'm working on. Here are the things I can get better because that's the type of conversation we need to have in leadership. I'm not a perfect leader, um, but I, I try to do better. And I try to make sure that I'm not holding other people back. And I also, but that's the other part of it. I don't, because it was funny. Um, I did my direct supervisor survey and somebody, half the question, there were 12 questions, mark me as needs approval on half the question. And I was just like, what is that about? Uh -huh. And you know, there was part of me like, okay, check yourself. So we have a whole, we was on Google Meets, my whole team's talking, saying how great I was, how much of a support I was, how I pushed them. And I'm just like, what is this about? And one of my team members called me and apologized to me. And the person said to me, based on hearing everyone else, she said, um, I had to consider that either A, you were just treating me differently than everybody else, or it was a me thing and not a you thing. And mm -hmm. the person said, you know, based on my interaction with you, um, she uh, said specifically, you brought a level of professionalism to this job that I'm not used to. And that's how, that's how I was. Like, if I'm going to your classroom, I see excellence, I'm going to let you know. Excellence, excellence, excellence. I saw mm -hmm. excellence in, in February. I saw excellence this week. And I, I'm in their classrooms on a weekly basis. Yeah. Um, that's the other thing, too, because I had a principal, like, you never saw this person. So I didn't want to be like that. I want to be in the classroom. But I've also, if you're struggling, I'm going to say, you need to fix this, fix this. Because for me, when I look at those kids in my classroom, I see my children. I see, mm -hmm. like, if I wouldn't let you do that to my sons, I can't let you do that as someone else's. So it's like, how do I hold people accountable and not become the people that I, I had problems with? 
um, and also support the children. So that's the thing I've been kind of battling was because um, as uh, someone said in my thing that I'm a uh, straight to the point, I'm very direct. So <laughs> um, my writing world is not the only place. I'm very direct in person. And uh, no, <laughs> so I, I'm trying to be direct. It's kind of like um, a deacon from my church told me, says, Shante, you draw more bees with honey than vinegar. <laughs> so I'm trying to um, <laughs> keep that in mind because things need to be said, but it's the way you said it, say it sometimes. So mm -hmm. I don't sugarcoat stuff to the point of they didn't get the meshes. Cause I'm like, look, like this classroom was not managed. You can't keep kicking these kids out. Cause I'm gonna bring them back inside and sit in here with them and get them back on track. But you got to get this going and let me help you. I think one of the one of the things that always draws me to your pieces is this very direct approach you take, and I think that's why a lot of your pieces resonate with folks. Not just because I think you speak about real things that I, people can say I can relate to that, but I think it's just it's very direct and it's raw and it's filtered and it's it's not mush. It's people, you read it and be like, damn, that's happened to me before. Or I've seen that happen to somebody. And so it, it is interesting that, and it's good that you don't take some of those negative experiences that you might have experienced as a teacher, because now you're in a position to uplift, you know, another black woman, because you might not have gotten that in, 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 your, in your climb to the top, but like some woman is going to look up and say like, Okay, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be like her, right? And so the last thing you wanna do is right, like close that door because they may not have that strength and resolve like you did, right? To keep pushing, they may be somebody that if they, if somebody shuts the door on them and don't support them, that they leave the profession, and then we miss out on possibly an amazing educator. And I think that's that's one of the things that I think about not just for black women, but you know, black blacks in general in this education. Like we have an obligation, right? to do right by the profession, one, to make sure we don't close the door for somebody else, but make sure that we give somebody else the courage to make sure that they keep persevering. So uh, if you're just tuning in again, we love in the comments. I'm going to get these posted. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Make sure you share, like this video. We're about to have a dynamic conversation today. Um, and, you know, we're about to get to the meat, you know, <laughs> of why we came on the show this evening. And, I mean, it's in the title, right? And so this idea of unapologetically black. So I have my own definition, right? So before the show, I was like, you know, let me just do my research a little bit, right? I just wanted to just get out of this. So I found this quote by Cornell West and it, it got, it has me thinking. And so folks that know that watch the show every now and then I go into like these soliloquies. So I'm like, I'm gonna keep it brief, but it's some stuff I want to get out of my chest. And I want you to kind of respond to what I, for what I'm going to say, but also define for the folks for you what unapologetically black is. So um, there's a quote by Cornell West, and I'm going to find it says, in America, to be successful, you can't call yourself unapologetically black. And what he meant was that when people are truly unapologetically black and truthful, that they don't last long. Right. So you think about Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Right. They, they didn't last to their 40s. Right. W.E.B. Du Bois went off to Africa because when you're unapologetically black in America. Right. It's a matter of life or death. So when I think about it from an educational standpoint, it might not be a life or death. But when you think about your career, when you want to be unapologetically black, and as we state in our blogs for black children, you risk putting your career on a line simply because there's a lot of people in the system. And I'm going to use your term, a lot of people in the system and a lot of players who make a lot of money off the back of the failures of black children. So when you speak up about the inequalities and the lack of resources or the fact that you're getting all this money to turn around these schools when, in fact, you really don't want to turn the school around because it'll put you out of business. When you speak up about that, you basically put your career your, as an educator on the line. And you can lose it because there's some people that have major pool and strings, especially in Indianapolis. And honestly, like I said, they're making their money off the backs of the failures of black children. No one's really truly, I said, not no one. There's not enough people working to truly change these schools and the educational outcome for black children because if they do that then they become obsolete i'm in the business of i'm working myself out of a job i want my school to be the best so they can say you know what mcguire you've done your piece we can put somebody else in there because that means black children are, are are succeeding but i think there's too many folks that again they're making this money so they really don't want us to succeed they're gonna give us a little bit right so we can show a little bit of growth but they're gonna keep getting this money so they can you know make money off of us. So when I think about being unapologetically black, 
I want to be that way, but I, I got to get to a space. And you have children, you have a husband, you have a home. But sometimes I get to a point, I might be willing to put my career on the line because I will be okay. We got master degrees. You're working on your doctorate. If we needed to go to a university level, we could get another job, right? But these black children don't have a chance. So when you think about unapologetic black, first, like, respond to what do you think what I said, but like, how would you define unapologetically black and your approach to the way you educate? I would say when I think about unapologetically black, it's like being myself. And the reason I say that is on my um, website, educatorbarns.com, I wrote a piece called I'm Black Enough because mm. throughout my life, I've had people in my own family, not like my mom and dad, not the media, like the standing, like, well, you you just trying to be white. You're not black enough. You can't play space. You can't do this. You're not black. <laughs> All yep. you need to take your black card away, or you're weird. Um, you don't watch BET. You watch all this sci-fi stuff. You're what white band are you listening to now? Mm -hmm. And so throughout my life, it's like, well, you're not black enough. I'm like, I'm unapologetically black, but I'm me. Like black is not all these stereotypes that make you a black person. I normally don't fit in those boxes. And when people get to know me, they're like, you're different than like black people I know. And that, that's so annoying because I'm like, then apparently you don't know a lot of black people because mm. all the black people in my circle, none of them are alike. I can't just put us all together and say, we all like this, or we all do this. We're all unique people. But what I think about is how I came to NDK 12. So you and I were both in the Teach Plus yeah. all the together. And we were yeah. in the social justice group. And don't get me started about how all the black folks seem to be in that group. You know, that was the catalyst for like our our anger. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I'm just like, oh, so we don't need black folks in these other groups. Cause I think I think I put social uh justice on there, but it wasn't like my only choice. But we can put it in that group. But anyway, <laughs> David had wrote this piece and he said, hey, will you come on this piece and write it with me? So one of the first pieces I had published for NDK 12 mm -hmm. was I'm a black, we wrote about being black educated, but we were only being seen as just a, a plenarians mm -hmm. and trying to get out of the classroom and do other things. They wouldn't take, let you come out the classroom because you're so good with the black kids. You're so good getting the data in the classroom. You can't come out of the classroom. And so that was like me kind of being like unapologetic, like being me. And you're right. So I talk a lot about like having more than one job offer. What I don't talk about a lot, which I'll talk about here, is opportunities I've had blocked in Indianapolis by so-called white allies and other black folks who kind of try to blackball me. Uh -huh. I was invited for this assistant principal interview. And the person who invited me, like, Shanta, you got this. This is the formality. Told me, now this is how shady this was. Told me about the competition. Told me who I was up against. I knew it on the resume. Like, straight up shady, right? Uh -huh. like, okay, let me go in this interview. I sat, sit, sit down at the interview table, and there were people at the interview, and they're like, oh, you're that lady from NDK12. Oh. And when she said that, I was like, this interview is done. So I was just sitting there and, and the question didn't even have nothing to do with the job. None of the questions that I'm prepared to answer. It was more about my philosophy and how I feel about things. I, and I, I was, I just told the people, I said, I don't know if this is going to be a good fit, but here's my thing. If I'm sitting in an interview with you and I feel I have to lie or hide who I'm going to be, then this is not going to work because I know how I'm going to show up to work. And I think about another time, a um, organization was like, Hey, Shanta, there's this job. I, it was like five rounds. I get the job offer, accept the job. And then the person that was going to be my boss, that person's boss had a problem with me also teaching at IUPUI and said, you need to end your contract with IUPUI because we want you to com be committed to us. And so I, I walked away from the job offer because I said, you're not going to dictate what I do outside of this job. That's right. Well, the person who had been on my reference list for a while was upset because apparently I was like, they're diverse. They helped them get this diverse person. That was mm -hmm. me. And so when I went to go interview for another job that I had, when they reference check them, check this person, that person goes, well, Shantae hops around for jobs. So she may not be here for long. And that got me, I was going to have the job. And they took the job away because of that person. And so, and it was funny. I had to go to this banquet and this person was going to be at the banquet. And I told him, and my husband hates going to these education things. <laughs> people are always talking to you and I'm just there to hold your purse. I don't have time for this. 
And the person kept trying to talk to me. And the person's like, Sean, tell me to finish our conversation. And I said, I'm not having a conversation with you. And I turned right back around and looked at my husband. And this person actually was in my school building this school year, trying to talk Ooh. to me. About and it was like, uh, Shantae, do you recognize me? I said, I recognize you. I said, I'm busy. I got classrooms to go into. That's right. And I'm like, there's no conversation I need to have with you because I done good. I did good work for you. I helped you do a lot of stuff. I thought you were an ally. But the moment me, your black hire, backed out an opportunity and made you look bad, you want to go and say something that wasn't actually true. And mm -hmm. so she spoke to the fact that in IPS, my position got eliminated, not any fault of my own. So when she said I hopped around, that was actually what this person was referring to. Hopping and I'm around. like, that's not even the whole story. Uh, so, I mean, it's so there's 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 pros and cons. You be yourself and there's opportunities going to be blocked. But because I have people that are right back to me because uh, somebody wrote back to one of the pieces and said, how do you get to certain position where people keep blocking you? And I and I just sound so lame. I say keep pushing through because the opportunities are getting blocked are not for you. If oh, you yeah. got that opportunity, you wouldn't thrive in that environment. Mm -hmm. Every day would be hell and you wouldn't want to be there. So if an opportunity get blocked to say it's not for me and there will be an opportunity where you're going to find like minded people who are uh, going to be like, hey, let's work for the kids. And when I say like minded, I don't mean we agree about everything oh, no. if you're at a school and everybody agrees. That's a problem. There should be some debate about some things so we can are doing the best options. But someone who's going to um, work with you. Yep, absolutely. So uh, the comments are lighting up. Folks, folks got riled up with that piece. So for those that are listening, if you can, hop in the comments. Just share with Shantae now, what does it mean to be unapologetically black to you? We would love to get your insight. I got some folks from Kiana and Jadai have, have both mentioned. Like, they, I mean, they, they're, they're, they're echoing the things that you're saying uh, and, and loving it. And I just want to hear from, from other folks, like, what does it mean to be unapologetically black? Because you know what? You know what I've learned? Shantae and I, I don't know if this happened. So those that know me, listen, because this is my show, so I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. So those that know me know that early this school year, I went through a very uh, personal situation, right? That one humbled me, right? Um, not only as a man, but as a leader, right? And so being able to be humbled and be more appreciative, because when, when, when you work hard for something for so long and it almost gets taken from you, you get you get a deeper appreciation, right? And you understand fully that people are looking up to you. And I talk about that a lot. Like I have this whole mindset that like I cannot shut the door for other people, right? And so you talked about it when we talked about the conversation about black women, that as a black man, like I I now experience what white men is experience in the regular world, right? As a as an educated black school leader that is articulate and whatever. I have this sense of privilege, right? Because I can I can say a little more things like a white man can do in normal society. I can do, I can move differently in education, right? I acknowledge that privilege that I have, right? Um, but I know that now and I have to take into account, like how do I make sure that I galvanize a group of people? It was one of the, the, the reasons why I started this show, right? Because I can say things and do things because I have a platform and how do we use that platform to make sure that we are being unapologetic about supporting and educating our black children. And again, in the K-12, we're not, we don't discriminate. Ask somebody say that to me. Y'all ain't talking about black kids. Yeah. Okay. Like it's like school choice, right? Like if I, if I don't like this school, I go to another school. If I don't like seafood, I'm not going to go to Red Lobster. Right. That's so if you don't like to hear stories about black children, then don't, don't read us, read our stuff. And so I look at when we talk about being unapologetic, like we have to come together as people and rise up because again, I'm going to say this, so I'm blue in the face. There's people making money off our kids. I have a one-year-old daughter that they're hoping to make money off of her. You have twin, what, fourth graders, right? Fourth grade son, be Fourth grade next year, yeah. That folks are hoping that they are failing so I can make money off of them, right? Like that's a problem. They, they're not saying, you know what, I'm building these schools because I want to make sure that your two sons, my daughter, and the other black kids are successful. And so it's our job in our blog, on these shows, any chance that we get on our social media where we tweet something, people follow, that we speak up today. And, I, and I'm saying for everybody that's listening, that truly cares and says that you care about the, the well-being of black children, we have got to speak up. We have to. 
and we cannot be afraid because here, if we're afraid, they can't fire all of us because they need us at some point. Because whether they like it or not, who going who gonna to teach that little black kid that none of y'all want? Right? So, like, it's, they're going to need us. And we just have to keep positioning ourselves where, as you say, like, you have to make sure that no matter what, that you're going to be marketable. Somebody blocks the door for you, there's going to be somebody that would be more than happy to say, they don't want you. I do. Right? Because you also, in addition to the things you write about, we always talk about, I know what I'm doing. I can do this school thing. Whether it's teaching, coaching, leading, I can do this. Right? And so, I just, I think we have to just come together as people, right? Um, and, I, and, and I'm going to get some of these comments up, right? I'm on unapologetic here for black kids. Absolutely, right? My first and only responsibility. You know, I became a parent and my whole perspective has changed. I look at these kids now and I'm like, if Zuri, if, I, if that's not good enough for Zuri Ray, it's not good enough for nobody, period, right? And, and that's just how I operate. There's our boy, Andrew. Andrew Pillow, another one of our uh, fellow bloggers is on here. Um, absolutely. Um, and then Kiana said, as our friends from the A Black Hands would say, black kids are the new cotton, man. Listen, hey, shout out to the A Black Hands and especially Chris Stewart, because I don't know if any of you all know, like NDK 12 is under the umbrella of Bright Beam, which is led by Chris Stewart. And he's basically the past four or five years has given us a platform to speak our truth. And so we're just greatly appreciative for all the work that he's doing and a platform that we're given. So uh, we can stay on this unapologetically black the whole show, but I know there's some other stuff we want to talk about. So you are very in tune with educators around the city. And so I want to talk about like the mistreatment of black educators in school, right? So I'm sure you have some stories that black educators, I know I do, of black educators who have shared with us their experiences, right? But maybe... Think about why, why, why is this mistreatment of black educators? Are we doing it to ourselves because we're not speaking up, or is it, the, or is it the system, or is it a mix of both? So, what do you think? Is it is it us doing it to ourselves? Is it a mix of both, or what for this mistreatment? Us I think it's a mix of both. And for me, like I, I thought, I think about when I was I was in Wayne Township for five years. I left for four, went back last year, and now I'm doing my current job. When I was in Wayne Township, my principal was always like, Shanta, you got good data. And I was doing my own thing. They say you were supposed to do this. I was doing that. And he said, Shanta's getting results. She can do whatever, right? That's right, so yeah. I would never speak up and share. Like, my, literally, my principal would cold call me during me to share what I was doing because I'm like, I don't want to share nothing. I don't. And then when I would share, people would say these nasty little negative comments. Like, for example, we were supposed to do historical fiction. That was it. But everybody else was going to do Anne Frank. I chose to use, do change because in eighth grade, they do American Revolution and social studies. So they already had that background. But change is from the perspective of a uh, enslaved black girl during the Amer American Revolution. Because I always tell my students, I said, every story in history, we're there. You mm. may not have heard it yet, but in Mrs. Barnes' class, you're going to hear about what we were doing during that time. So I told her, I wanted to see the American Revolution from the, eye, the viewpoint of black people. And that was, well, it's like, well... And well, some of the students didn't get exposed to the Holocaust because everyone didn't do Anne Frank. Now, that was a slide to me because I was the only person that chose not to do that. And so I would sit there and be like, I don't got time for this. Because every time I say something, somebody's going to comment with a slide comment. They're not going to say my name, but everybody knows they're talking about me. And so I'm like, you know what? That's fine. And then the piece I wrote about like what happened to me, um, that was a turning point because the next thing that happened that I didn't write in the piece, I was with my father. Uh, with my kids and I run, run into that principal from that piece and my father gave this person a good piece of their his mind and I was just like oh my and then I had to go to work like the next <laughs> week, right? this, this is a state fair and now at this point in time we were in school when the state fair happens mm -hmm. and that was a turning point for me because at that I was like probably my early I'm 36 now so it was early mm -hmm. 30s then and I, I said to my dad I said I can't have you fighting for me I gotta fight for myself like I was at the point that I just I was defeated by the whole situation. My dad knew it. He saw it and he said something I'm like, Daddy, you can't keep fighting for me. I got to open my voice. I got to fight for myself. So I left that um, particular school. And then moving forward, I was just like, I am going to speak up at these meetings. And like, for example, this school year, I spoke up about something in my school that made people uncomfortable. This school year, my school decided to have Black History Month during the International Festival. Now, I'm at the leadership meeting about it. <laughs> and I'm sitting here, right? 
And I'm like, and first I'm saying to myself, I'm just going to sit here, somebody else, because as a black person, for black history and all these things to happen, it can't just be you. If you are choosing to be in front of black kids, you are choo- you need to choose to be informed about black history and black culture and what's happening with black people. Like it shouldn't be my responsibility as a black educator. And I wrote mm-hmm. a whole thing about that. From black <laughs> you can go check that out. And so finally, I said, um, you know, we've had some feedback from some of the black families that they don't feel seen at the school. And I said, you know. When Black History Month is a part of the international festival, that's mm. part of the reason why. And one of the responses back to me was like, well, Shantae, what should we do about it? And I'm just like, that shouldn't be your response. I'm not responsible for this. And so right. I would say, um, because I said something next school year, um, international festivals move, Black History Month will stand by itself. But think about it, if I wasn't there and I didn't open my mouth to say that this is a problem, Nothing would have changed. And I still could have said something. And because what I wanted, I wanted to be changed that school, this school year. But the response was, you know, the, the wheels are in motion. We already mm-hmm. planned this. So we'll we'll table this for later. Um, but I still speak up about things. And, and, and I do the same in my professional world. But then as a parent, because that's the thing um, that bothers people. I live in Washington Township. I used to work in Washington Township. And when I'm not doing stuff with my kids or doing stuff in my school, I go to these meetings. And I'm going to tell you all something. There's hardly any black people, black parents at these meetings. And some of these white parents say some stuff, these meetings that are just inappropriate. Mm -hmm. The last meeting I went to, it was like social emotional stuff. Right. And this white lady stands up. I don't even know her name, but she'd be at all the meetings. She was like, well, <laughs> us in here have these problems. And, you know, I heard, you know, because all y'all white, that's what she says, all y'all white. And I know someone's going to say something about the diversity thing. And I'm sitting here and I'm here with my husband and he, and he hates coming to them. I'm like, babe, you have to come here. I'm tired of recounting the meeting that's too. Right. <laughs> and he's like, is she for real right now? None of us have problems. Who is us? And so, and he looked at me, he said, you're going to say something. So I did say something. And the one way up front, she was all like, you know, we got to work together. Uh, and I wrote a piece where I called her out, this particular person um, about uh, Amygdala Reset Room. They um, uh, Fox 59 wrote a whole story about it, And I wrote a counter piece to say, hey, this is what really is happening in my kid's school. Mm. You only can go to Amygdala Re- Reset Room if someone takes them. And there's no plan for that. So it actually doesn't happen. Um, so I kind of wrote about the truth. They were talking about, oh, we have no villain here. Mile and what? Because the system don't work. But y'all didn't say that in the piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let me tell you as a parent what really happened. And I asked about it at a, a parent PTO meeting. And here's what's interesting. So this is the second time I've kind of said something to this person. You know, Shantae, you know, we need to connect. Look, you on, on the district level, you know, you can look up my number in Skyward. You know, <laughs> you address in Skyward. So yeah. if you you want to connect with me? You know how to look me up. Heck, mm-hmm. you know people in the room that know me. You yeah. could have got my phone number while I was at the meeting. So this person has repeatedly told me they're going to connect with me. So I'm still sitting here waiting uh, for that to happen. But but I'm not for me not trying, but that what makes it hard because I have someone said, well, you can't, if you keep going to those meetings in Washington Township and saying stuff, you're never going to get hired there again. I said, that's okay. Because when I'm in Washington Township, I'm here as a parent. I'm fighting for my black boys, my two, I have identical twin boys. And I actually asked for their discipline records to be pulled. My one son, his discipline record is like 11 pages from this school year. On a, he's been on the honor roll since kindergarten, hasn't had any problems like this. At least this one son hasn't. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, what is going on? And even to the fact where the teacher was violating the 504, she actually took part of the 504 away as a punishment because in the room, like in the comm corner, it says you are important. He wrote on the wall that you are not important. And so because of that, she decided to not fall apart of his 504 mm-hmm. as a punishment and told me this. So this is not me just guessing. She told me this was a punishment to your child. But I'm like, so I don't got time to be sitting here being nice and being like polite to y'all because I got people in here not following a 504, a little document telling me it's a punishment for my kid. And they're going to tell me, and granted, should my kid have wrong or wrong? No. Did I no. talk to you about that? Yes. Did he get a consequence? Yes. But I said back to the teacher, you need to figure out why my kid thinks that he is not important in your classroom. That's what you need to worry about. And mm-hmm. even when the school year ended, he re- he said, Mom, I really don't want to get on the Zoom call. And I, we were watching Governor Holcomb when he said, <laughs> 
My son jumped up and said, I never have to see that lady's face again. <laughs> so conversation because like, I'm like, look, we not been talking about people like that. But for my son who's loved school, to mm -hmm. to the point where he's like, I don't want to see my teacher's face again. Mom, I do not want to get on the Zoom at the end of the school year last Thursday. I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to see her. And then she emailed us on Friday, you know, saying, well, can't. Can I have a private one on one with him? And I said back to her, I said, you can send him a message on Canvas. He does not want to get on Zoom with you. That's why he wasn't out there on Thursday. Absolutely. And so for me, I have to be unapologetic because, I mean, I think about the events that's happening in the world today mm -hmm. with black males. Like, I don't have time to be waiting for these things to happen because I can't have them held back here because there's, there's this whole world where, you know, all, you can't even go and watch birds for Pete's sake and all this stuff that's happening. Like mm -hmm. I have to prepare my children and I feel like I have to prepare other black children. So like when I'm fighting for black kids, I see Jeremiah Barnes, I see James Barnes. That's what I see when I'm in these classrooms. So I'm like, if I wouldn't tolerate this for my kids, as a school administrator, I'm not tolerating this for somebody else's kids. And that's the type of administrator you want in your school building. You want an administrator to say, if this is not good enough for my kids, it's not good enough for your kids. Absolutely. And, and I hold fun to that. And so when I think about, you know, sometimes when I think about the mistreatment of, of like, it, like I understand, we understand the system, right? So I'm not going to get in a tangent about the system is not de designed for us. We know the system isn't, right? So if you know that and sit quiet and allow yourself to get mistreated, you're the problem. You're not just the problem for yourself. You're the problem for the person next next to you, the, the other educator coming behind you, those in, before you. Like, we've got to speak up. And it can't be. And I, I get it. We all got to pay our bills, especially with COVID, because, you know, like this, this is a pandemic and we need our job. But we can't just sit silent and allow people to disrespect us. Right. Like, this is where I feel like. We, we as educators, we got to get a tad bit more Malcolm in us, right? Like, make sure that they don't ever disrespect you again. I'm not saying beat them up and cuss them out, right? But I'm saying you make it very clear that I'm not the black one you're going to disrespect. Now, you might be able to disrespect that other one, but you're not going to disrespect this one, right? And so we have to own that and make sure that we don't allow ourselves to get mistreated. I talk all the time because I had somebody early in my career said, David, don't let them pigeonhole you into being a dean because they're gonna walk. They're gonna walk in your classroom and see how much to engage with the kids, and the kids listen to you, and you have this great classroom management. And they're like, you know, he will make a great dean. Don't let them pigeonhole you. You have to make sure you know the instruction. So let me speak to my black men. Learn the instruction. I don't care if you teach PE, if you're a special ed, if you are a hall monitor. Learn the instructional piece. Otherwise, you will pigeonhole yourself. And that's the way of mistreating you because they'll never see you as an instructional leader. They'll see you as the token black person. As just because you're unapologetically black don't mean you're the end all be all black. OK, so like understand the difference. Right. Make sure that they don't pigeonhole you. And that's one of the things that, you know, we that I try to talk about in my writings. Like I, I, I talk about the 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 instructional piece and being an instructional leader and coaching people. Cause I don't know who might read my blog, right? We talk about sometimes people read our blog on the flipping. I had a couple of people read my blog and reach out about a job, right? Like, so because of just the things that I talk about it. So just, I, I tell particularly black men, make sure they don't pigeonhole you into this form of discipline. And to my black ladies, make sure that they don't, pigeon, they don't, they don't exclude you out the conversation of being a black lady. The greatest, the best leader I've had, it's Kelly Marshall is a black woman. And I, I know for a fact, like I, I've seen some amazing black female educators. But to your point, for some reason, society doesn't see the black woman as the leader. Right. Um, you know, we have what two now black female superintendents. Right. But the fact that we were celebrating that in 2019 was a shame. Like, why, why are we still celebrating first? Like that that bothers me when we still celebrate first for black people. It's 2020, right? So we need to make sure that these are ongoing occurrences and that's how they mistreat us, right? They mistreat us by they give us these positions, but they don't really give us no power. And so I, I'm not giving advice to Dr. Woodson and Superintendent Johnson, but I'm just saying like, do know that there are black women there are black little girls that are looking up to you and just make sure that you're not just a figurehead. I'm not saying they're a figurehead. So please make sure people quote me right. I'm not calling them a figurehead. I'm just making sure it's embrace that you are in this position. And there are people, young girls, 
looking up to you. And even though I have a one-year-old daughter, I want my one-year-old daughter to see that and say, you know what, daddy, I can run a large corporation. You damn right, baby, you can, right? So that's what we have to do as black people. And, and we, in our blogs, you know, I like to think that hopefully people read our blogs and are encouraged to reach out and say, hey, Shantae, I, I wrote this piece. Is it, do you think you can publish this on your website? Like, that's why we're writing because we're trying to elevate the voice, right? We write it for black people, to black people, or black black people. So we need more black people, you know, voices because NDK 12 is not the three of us. It's not David, Shantae, and Andrew. NDK 12 is the Indianapolis community. We just happen to be the ones, we just happen to be, you know, the voices right now, but we need more voices. So I, we need y'all, right? Because we're, we're, we're getting mistreated and sometimes we get mistreated and don't even know it. And that's a whole nother show and I ain't gonna get into that. Cause you can be mistreated and don't even know. It's like being in an abusive relationship. Everybody know you being abused, but you. How you not see the mistreatment, right? And so I sometimes tell folks, you know, I'm like, hey, they're not treating you right. I, I don't know if you notice, but they're using you, right? So we, we owe that to each other. So I want to, it, it's, it's for, we're about 45 minutes in. I want to make sure we talk about two things because you told me in the, when we first talked about this, that you have a third installment of this series that you're doing. And I, I want you to give folks, a teaser. Give them enough that they want to read it, but don't give them everything. And, and I think one of the things that we both talked about is we talked about the problem and all these other things, but let's offer some solutions. And if you're tuning in, uh, this is an engaging show. So I want you, we're going to talk about what are the solutions, right? To how we make sure we elevate and being unapologetically black. So before we do that, Shante, tell us about this third installment that you have for the piece and, and why, why you're doing it. What's the focus? That is actually the focus of the third installment is like some uh, solutions because I read, I try to do my best to respond to all comments and messages, you know, if they're like people are asking me things. But what I want to add is like, so what do you do about it? What do you do if you're in this situation? And so one of the things I want to share, like for myself, like I have mentors, black female mentors outside of my job. And like I was at one of their houses. It was so funny because I was not feeling good this week. And she she called my cell phone, called my landline, text my cell phone. as like, Sean, to come to my house. I'm like, I'm not trying to come out. And I'm all like COVID-19. You know, you're, yeah. you're in like the you're over 65. You in that population. I'm saying all this stuff. And she's like, Sean, get your behind out of your house. Come by my house. So I came by the house and she had books for me. She had mm. resources. And like she asked me, she knew um, that I was on a panel with Dr. Woodson about the black, um, the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was going to be a follow up meeting with my husband and I, because I was going to talk about the 504 thing and some other things that happened. And she said, well, how did that go? And I said, well, you know, the meeting was supposed to be March 17, school closed. And she said, so she, and then she goes, well, didn't Washington Township do that Zoom with all those <laughs> elementary parents so they can't Zoom you and your husband? Why have you <sighs> Schedule. And I said, well, I'm not. And she said, Shante, I need you to worry about it. They said they were going to meet with you and your husband. You need to uh, follow a uh, back. And like real talk, the, how some of this got started. I was sitting in the classroom um, in social. I was in the social studies classroom doing evaluation and my phone ring, my cell phone rings. And I'm like, who was calling my cell phone? I'm like, this looks like CEC. If you don't know what that is, that's like the headquarters in Washington Township. It was Dr. Woodson calling my cell phone while I was at work, sitting in the classroom doing the observation. And so that's how kind of how the conversation, and I give her credit. Like she reached out, she said, I heard that you have some concerns about Washington Township, mm -hmm. let's talk. And my, my mentor was like, Shante, you need to keep, you need to read this. Um, This will be good. Um, Cause she gave me some books about being a leader, um, like some um, still some difficult things I can go through. And then just letting me know like if I need someone to vent to, like I'm, she's my person. But on the flip side, I have younger black educators that are like in their late uh, 20s that I talk to. Now I've spent a lot of time, um, the, the blessing about the pandemic, I've been able to talk to a lot of them. Just start, they've been, some of them have been teachers I've coached, some of them have been teachers I've worked with, um, and that I just talk to and I mentor and I, and I give them the, I'm, I'm being the person I wish I had earlier yeah. in my career. Like, cause I didn't have anybody. I just, my whole job was to do a good job, make sure the kids learn and teach myself. Because the one thing when you talked about being overlooked, um, I had a white colleague who's a good friend of mine today. And she said, Shante, they keep passing you over, but you can do this better than the people they select. You, mm. need, to, you need to get out here and, and do this stuff. I'm like, well, I don't want to do all that stuff. But that person was like, no, Shante, 
how is it that person leading this, but you got the better data? You the one that should be up here leading this. And so that person kind of encouraged me to be like, I need to professionally develop myself. Like I, I cause I had an interview and someone says, you have five licenses. And I say, yeah, and I've had a job in every single one of those licenses. And that's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm in a doctoral program. So my thing is like, I'm gonna, I want to exude black excellence. I don't want to just tell kids like, I, this is the bar. I want them to see like, if Mrs. Barnes is up here, going to school, being a wife, being a mom, writing on the, doing this, mm -hmm. on the committee on here trying to help this. I want them to see like, you can do this too. And a lot of times we don't, and I'm real with students. I'm like, Mrs. Barnes got this homework. Like I had to redo a paper and this, and this is the first time I've had to redo a paper <laughs> in college class. Let me tell you, I was shook and devastated. He <laughs> wrote like an essay back to me to tell me how to fix. I was just like, and I told the students about it. I said, Mrs. Barnes had to do a, a rewrite and I was upset. I said I was mad, but I said I had a choice. I could take the feedback and get better or sit here and pout. And so being real like that with students is that's what students want. And sometimes you just don't get that. Sometimes the white educators, they just can't make they just can't won't don't. I don't know. Make that connection. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, when I and, and I can't wait to read the pieces, I know you're going to give some some actionable solutions. And But when I think about solutions, right, for like this whole idea. I think I said it earlier, like we have to first first recognize when you're being mistreated, right? Like recognize when you're being mistreated. That's important. Then when you are being mistreated or seeing somebody else being mistreated, speak up. So like I'm going to like pivot. So everybody's seen the video with the man in Minnesota, right? Um, being mistreated. Uh, I mean, he had the, his neck was and you watch the people watching. Right. And so the, the concept came up like. People should have jumped in. Yeah, but when you jump in, like you're thinking about, am I good? Like, are they gonna shoot me? Right. But like somebody like should have called somebody. Like it should have been more people. But it's like this idea when you see somebody being harmed, right? Another black person, like we have to do whatever we can protecting ourselves to make sure that we speak up for that, right? And so the first thing I tell people is like, one, know that you're being mistreated. When you are being mistreated, speak up for yourself. When you see other black people being mistreated, damn it, speak up, have their back. Right. Don't let them mistreat us, because here's the thing. White people ain't letting other people did mistreat white people. I mean, they're just not. They're not. They're not going to let you do it. So, like, we shouldn't let it happen to us either. And so another solution is to use it. Black people, we got to clean our mirrors off because we are some beautiful people doing some amazing things. And to your point, you're sharing with folks. So if your students know that, wait a minute, Miss Barnes is going to school. Why are you going back to school, right? Why did you have to rewrite a paper? When they see that realness, that authentic side of you, you give them the freedom to make a mistake. You say, you know what? If Miss Barnes is going to school and Miss Barnes had to rewrite a paper, then I can rewrite mine. If she's trying to get another degree, then you're giving people the freedom, children, the freedom and a license to dream big. And that's my biggest thing. Like, we got to stop diminishing the dreams of our children, right? Give them the unapologetic unadmitting God to dream as big as they want to share with them. If you're going to school and also being a teacher or a leader, share that with your students, tell your teachers to share the experience, all the things that you're doing, because everybody needs to see that. That's part of the solution. And the last piece is we got to come together. We got to come together. People. There's some amazing groups. Uh, I said it earlier. Melanie and Ed is doing some big stuff where they are bringing leaders together. Um, I, I opened the platform up and, and Shantae's our editor. If you are someone that has a thought and want to write, we love posting stories from black educators. So if you've said you 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 have this thought, write it, write an op-ed, write a piece. We will definitely post it on NDK 12. We will push it out. We will support. We're going to edit it first, but we're going to push it. We're going to push it out. OK, but we're going to share that because we're all about celebrating people that are uplifting the voice. So just people step into your purpose. Right. I think pastors say that a lot. Right. Like step into your blessing. You got a blessing. You need to step into it. And so this show, Unapologetically Black, it's the NDK 12 Takeover. Shante, before we go, I do a segment where I want the guests to share some other things that they're, they're doing. So outside of being a mom, a wife, an academic dean, a writer and an editor, you're also a gardener. And I just I, 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 you got to talk about that because you gave me some insight um, for a garden that you help um Build at one of the schools you were at, and we got approved for that fellowship. So I want to thank you oh, for that. Yes. <laughs> um, because that's another thing, that's another area that it's a whole nother show that black people, black kids aren't tapping into. And we can get into the whole wellness piece, but just talk to the folks about uh 
the the other persona that you have with your gardening, with the blog and the videos that you do with your son and things like that? Yeah, it's it's kind of funny because how I first started writing on the internet was about gardening. It was not about education. My middle name is Shakol. Um, so that's S-H-I-C-O-L-E. And I have a website called Gardener Shakol. That was like my first website. And so I, I blog, I vlog. Um, we are on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, Gardener Shakol. And it's like a generational thing. Uh, my great grandparents did it. My great uncles and aunts. My father did it. We had a garden as a kid. Um, I'm one of those people. I can't. I can can my own food. Um, <laughs> so like right now, I got kale growing. I got radishes growing. I got all the things. I just moved four streets over from my first house. So that was like a big deal. So this year, I'm I'm chronicling like starting a garden over from scratch. Mm. First, of what I've had for over a decade. But what's interesting is my kids know where their food comes from, and I. I spoke at the spirits in place. Um, it was the power of food. And I actually spoke about the fact that, you know, black people are dying um, because we're just so unhealthy. And that and, and then what's interesting, my family's been guarding for a while, but they hadn't necessarily been healthy. And so when I started bringing <laughs> I brought um, I brought a massage kale salad. And you know, people are like, ain't no, ain't no salt pork in this. <laughs> you haven't even tried it. You have to try it. So now. I been I kept bringing it to Thanksgiving. I started bringing other stuff, healthier stuff. And what's interesting, some of the older people in my family, like, oh, I got high blood pressure. I have to, um, you know, I got to change my diet. And so now <laughs> I'm like putting in my recipes. So I've been putting my stuff online. My sons want us to publish a, a recipe book. But I'm like, and I do have a publishing company. That's something I yeah. started with my husband. We we're are gonna, we're gonna talk about that next. Yeah, because uh, I know you're your it's sons wrote a book, book, right? Yes, both of them. It's called um, Barnes um, Brothers Books. I named it after my twin sons. And um, the first two books we published are my son's books. And that was just something my sons, they are avid readers. Um, I did a video of my kids at the end of the school year, and my son lists off all the Percy Jackson books. And if you don't <laughs> know about Percy Jackson, those books are written about a sixth or seventh grade level. And my son is in, he just finished third grade. So both of my sons started school um, reading on the fifth grade level. Um, so that's a whole other conversation. Can I talk about literacy a lot? And I tell people, and this is not to sound mean, my kids are not any more special than any other black child. Mm -hmm. I just put some time and I did little things with them to get them to where they are. And so I talk to a lot of families like you don't have to be a teacher for your kid to be reading on grade level or beyond grade level. So I have a whole conversation about that. But right now I'm actually working with a preschool teacher from Chicago. So she, her last name is actually Barnes, but we are not related. <laughs> the first author I published. And what's interesting I've been talking to a, quite a few um, black educators in India. They're like, well, you don't charge. I don't charge anybody to publish a book. Now, as you said about editing, um, and you know this, I don't yeah. put to editing. Like, I, I'm about the business. Uh -huh. um, so I don't publish everything. I have a very low acceptance rate because I want to put out quality work. But as an English teacher for over a decade, I was just so sick and tired of being the person like, we need more kids of color in the books. We need. I'm like, well, I can keep talking about it or I can bring be the solution. And so that's why I did it. And for me, everything I do, I have a passion and that passion drives my work forward. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I just want to look out for people. And the other thing I'll say when you talked about uh, standing up for people, um, one of the things that I had, I have some Latina friends in education and I told, and I told the, cause I told you there's one person on my team that's um, Latina. And I said to her, I said, just because you're a bilingual doesn't mean you need to be a translating for everybody. You need mm. to be for yourself. Because think about this. There are jobs that pay you more for being bilingual, but we take advantage of a lot of our um, Latinx colleagues who are bilingual and mm. expect they're supposed to translate on demand whenever. And I said to her, I said, look, I said, it is reasonable for you to say, this is when I'm going to interpret for you. This is when I'm going to do this because you're doing your job plus another job. And yep. so sometimes you have to empower people and have that conversation because to me, I don't feel like I should be able to call you and have something translated into Spanish. I should value you as a person, value your time and understand. I'm going to ask you because that's not, you didn't get hired to be the bilingual interpreter. You got hired <laughs> to do this job and you just happen to speak Spanish. And so I didn't want to throw that out there. That's one of the things I've been trying to advocate for. Yes, I advocate for black people, but I also try to advocate for other people that are have different situations that I can come along inside and be an ally. Because we talk a lot about white allies, but black people also need to be allies to other yeah, people. Yeah, they do. 
reverse because they get put down, pushed aside, just like we are. And we don't need to be part of the problem. We need to also help them. So it's just is so, so much I try to be, be involved in. Absolutely. So I have some folks that wanted to, um, actually, I'm gonna get these comments posted. Uh, absolutely. I think I, I you, you already know I, I got a job for you. You stood me up. We're going to talk about that offline that, you know, I've been trying, but we're going to, we're going to connect for sure. But so should I tell you my, um, this is one of my teachers, Ashley Hogan says she wanted to connect. So I think I got your email address. So I'm going to put this and make, let me know if I got it correct. I think I did. Uh, is this where folks can reach you, right? Oh yeah, you got it. Yeah, there we go. So if you want to connect with uh, Shantae, I, I tell you, like she does a lot: gardening, education, uh, the books, uh, her, her publishing company. And again, like I said, when we talk about, I, she's she's not charging because one, yes, she's about the business because I know because I send her my pieces and she she lights me up too. Uh, and I was an English teacher, um, so but it's it's about when we put things on our blog, that means we're standing behind it. So. Just know if we publish you on our blog, we're gonna back you up. So any any backlash that you get, you gotta ally NDK12 because we put it on our blog and we get our stuff cross post a lot. So we definitely want to want to add to this. We also because I, I tweeted something earlier this week that pissed some people off because I talked about the fact that we are not a mouthpiece for other people. Because what people don't understand about publication sometimes, you have people that will pull out talking points for you and send you a nice email, look at data, analyze it, ask you to publish stuff. And I'm like, no, I said, we're not trying to be any of these other places. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be unapologetically us and we're trying to put our views out here. We're not interested in pitching your story for you. Um, if you want to self-publish that on your own platform, we're not That's here right. for that. And, I, and we turn down stuff when it seems like you're just using us because you think, and I always say this, just because you know we're all black folks, we have a bar, we're not just, seconds uh we're, we've got black excellence going on mm -hmm. and i tell people i'm like this is not up you're not and that's the other thing you gotta have a, a point of view because i david and andrew will attest to oh, that please do like, if you're not saying nothing i'm gonna be like okay what's the more story say something else like say something, say something. stand by something <laughs> the people are not going i tell people First, you gotta have a catchy title for them to click on it. If they get in one paragraph and it is boring, they're gone. So mm -hmm. you have to be saying something interesting, and sometimes it's controversial. And let it be controversial. Yeah. I got people that be anytime I say black children, what about all the children? All the children, oh. yeah. Oh man, listen. As soon as I start talking about principal stuff, somebody wants to say, "Well, that's why." I'm, I'm like, you know what? This is my opinion. This is our <laughs> platform, and so I'm gonna say it right. So listen, this has been Shantae. I, I, I knew we were going to bring the heat, uh, and we did. I think people are really excited. So, uh, everybody, if you could do me a favor, you're going to see it on my Facebook page, on my Twitter page. Share, retweet this video. I'm going to post the link for the actual audio version. Share this with everybody. This is a conversation that needs to be had. Um, also, please make sure that you check us out, NDK12. I'll put that back. Follow us on social media. Uh, read our blog, share our blogs, um, share our posts, keep this conversation going. You can catch us next week. Uh, we are going to, uh, I got Jadon uh, is going to, who's on my first show. We're going to have a conversation with uh, some folks from TFA. We're going to dispel some myths with TFA. So that's going to be next week's show. Same time, 730. This is the Recess Podcast, Real Education Conversation, explaining students in school. Uh, it's been an NDK 12 takeover. Shantae? I appreciate you. As I always said, you're one of the most prolific educational writers in our city. I think the work that you're doing um, needs to be uplifted more. I don't need to praise you uh, because you're phenomenal, but I, I, I just, I'm going to because I think your writing has motivated me to take more of a controversial approach. So I appreciate that. Um, and I just I, I hope people truly understand that the work that we're trying to do with our with our blog with this podcast, because it is part of everything we do at NDK12, it's just to uplift black children. So I appreciate everybody tuning in. This has been a Recess Podcast, and we're out.